Great. I don't have my gavel with me, so I just have this really big fish. Oh. Yeah, now you <laughs> the quorum being present, this meeting of the Annapolis Historic Commission shall come to order. This commission operates pursuant to the land use article of the annotated code of the state of Maryland local authority or the commission, which is derived from the municipal code of the city of Annapolis, chapter 21, section 56. The HPC operates pursuant to the state of Maryland Open Meeting Act and therefore no pending application shall be discussed between or amongst commissioners outside the public hearing to determine the disposition of the application. So I'll do a roll call now. Bill Williams. Here. Pat Zeno. Here. Kim Finch. Present. Bobby Collins. Present. Tim Leahy. Here. Um, we also have staff, Roberta Lehner. Here. And John Tower. Here. And finally, Tammy Hook, who is our recorder. Here. Great. All right. Um, this is a, the only item on the agenda tonight is a pre-application and we do not have to swear uh, that the application uh, applicants are tested by assessment. Um, any announcements, Roberta? Yes, um, I just would like to remind everyone that the NAPC Forum 2020 will be virtual August 3 through 9, and uh, registration is available now online for $100 each, and that is reimbursable. Um, I'd also like to announce that uh, we now have a new director of comprehensive planning and his name is Eric Lashinsky and he is in the process of moving here from Austin, Texas. His first day in the office will be Tuesday. Great. That's all. Okay. Um, so the only item on the agenda tonight is City of Annapolis, the stormwater uh, retention project, which um, has been going on for a few years. And we had a brief discussion before uh, the meeting. This is a, a long, ongoing project, which we've seen many times. And many of the components of the project have already been deemed feasible by the commission. Um, we've had five or five meetings at least. Um, so tonight we'll be going through, uh, Lisa Greco will be taking us through some of the history of the project and telling us what's new. There's some more details and um, and and also I would like to acknowledge that this has been through many other public testimonies outside the HPC. Uh, lots of community input from the um, Board of Education and the, the city residents. So um, it, it's been going on for a long time. And tonight we just like to see what's new and give any potential feedback on what more detail would make it important from the HPC guidelines. Did he freeze? Yes. <laughs> Tim, you froze. <laughs> I know I did. Oh, okay. Still frozen? No. I was still frozen? No, you're right. Go. Good to go. At least it might be frozen. I'm, I'm good. Are you ready for me to begin? I am. Please. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Tim, um, you you may want to go through the pre-application uh, thing to let them know that it's a pre-application. Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> yeah, so just so the applicant understands, this is a pre-application, which is a consideration given to applicants. Um, any any uh, discussion we have or um, 
feedback we may provide should not be considered as binding on the final application. Do you acknowledge that? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Lisa Greco, and I'm a civil engineer with the City of Annapolis Department of Public Works. Uh, I'm the project manager on this project, the City of Annapolis Stormwater and Flood Mitigation Project. Tonight, we have with us um, a team of our consultants. Um, we have Ed Masick, who's a principal of a local architectural firm, Wheeler Goodman Masick. We have Scott Seibel with AECOM. He's the senior archaeologist on the project. We also have Romaine Kessiger, who will be, who's a landscape architect with AECOM and will be presenting um, the uh, changes to the plaza area. Um, and we also have Jay Graham, who's a senior principal with Moody Graham, and he's the designer for the uh, memorial, which is, while it's not a city project, it is part, it's on the Newman Park parcel and is therefore going through all the permitting process with us and we're coordinating with them uh, to streamline the construction and dovetail it with the construction of this uh, city project. So I'm going to talk a little, this is an overview of the different things that um, we'll discuss, present tonight. Um, first of all, solving the problem. We're going to give a little history since we have some new members on the commission. And uh, we'll talk about our current status and how the construction is now going to be phased. We'll have a, a section on archaeology and Ed will speak to the architecture of the control building and the generator enclosure, which, as you noted, Tim, um, has been before the uh, commission numerous times and is deemed feasible. We'll also be talking about uh, the Newman Street Plaza area that's being redesigned, the hardscape and the landscape. And then we'll um, present the Guardians of the First Amendment Memorial, which uh, we had presented on our last uh, trip before HPC. And then I'll talk a little bit about the bulkhead and our project milestones. So solving the problem. Here are some photos of um, flooding that occurs that probably many people are familiar with uh, on Newman Street and on Dock Street. Uh, we see this frequently. The um, flooding is due to uh, the tides and uh, this, what I wanted to point out is while the other photos were a little bit on the gray side, um, most of the flooding occurs due to just high, high tides. Um, in this photo, you can see it's a little bit sunnier out. Um, in the lower uh, corner, we have a graph there that plots uh, mean sea level rise against the um, increased number of uh, flood events that we've been seeing since 1950. So again, I want to reiterate that this nuisance flooding is strictly due to high, high tides. It's not always related to storms. We have king tides that could add one to two feet to a, a normal high tide, and this is the result of it. Um, we've seen an increase in flooding events over the last 50 years. Um, on average, in the 50s, you might have had three days a year where uh, flooding occurred. We ha now have on average more than 40 days a year of flooding and the severity of the flooding is much more significant than it was in the past. Um, probably our worst year was 2011. We had over 60 days of flooding. So this photograph is of uh, the intersection of Compromise and Newman Street, one of the key um, flood locations. And this is the location for this uh, project. Some of the impacts of the nuisance flooding is that it blocks access to downtown. Compromise Street is a ma major arterial to the city. Um, it impacts access to our government buildings, businesses, and schools. It also creates traffic congestion when we have to turn away traffic from Eastport and redirect it through other uh, roads in the city. It also impacts life safety. Um, emergency response times are uh, increased and our evacuation routes are impacted. And lastly, economic impacts to local businesses and events such as the boat show. Uh, this past year, they had 
um, one full day, they lost probably the nicest day. It was sunny and they had severe flooding um, and it was due to a stalled storm off of the coast. So um, this is the problem that we're trying to solve. The objective for this project is to address tidal or nuisance flooding on Compromise Street, which accounts for 95% of the flooding that we experience downtown. And um, this graph here is a graph of um, the high tides. We use, there's a tidal gauge at the Naval Academy and we utilize the data from that tidal gauge uh, to look at predicted uh, tide levels. That's the blue uh, lines. Um, there's two high tides each day and two low tides. And then the green um, portion of the graph uh, represents the verified actual tides for those days. So this is a graph, a plot of the tides for the month of September in 2018. And during that month, we experienced 13 days of flooding uh, on which six of them, Compromise Street was temporarily closed. So this project, uh, this flood mitigation system that we're proposing has different components. Um, there's some storm drain improvements. Um, we're going to um, realign the localized system. When I say the localized system, I'm talking about the storm drain system that is right in the vicinity of Compromise and Newman Street. Um, we're also going to, um, there's a what we call the bypass system. That's the storm drains that are at higher elevations and aren't currently backing up and flooding the streets, such as on Main Street. Those, those storm drains will not be realigned, but will be made watertight and have backflow preventers put in them. Um, there'll be a pump, pump station, including a wet well, which is a below grade structure. And then above grade, we'll have the control building and emergency backup generator. And then the project includes some grading modifications. Um, in this portion of the project, we'll be building a new bulkhead with a seawall on top of it at the end of Newman Street, because that's the source of a lot of the flooding that occurs at the intersection of Compromise and Newman. Not only is it coming up through the storm drains at the intersection, but it's also coming just right over the bulkhead and flooding the street. There's also um, we, the other uh, location for minor grading modifications is uh, the handicap ramp at the dinghy dock area where the Alex Haley statue is. Um, we propose to raise that just a few inches. And what that does is will give us a uniform elevation of protection up to elevation 3.2 around the perimeter of market slip. Uh, many of our, infra much of our infrastructure that's already in place is at higher elevations. But um, we do have some private property that isn't quite as high, and um, the uh, the the elevation three point two that I just mentioned is really based on the adjacent private property elevation that we're be, we're tying into. For example, the head of um, Market Slip, where the new seawall is from our last bulkhead replacement project, the top of that seawall is at elevation five, which is the base flood elevation for downtown as set by FEMA. And, but the back deck of the fleet reserve is only up to elevation 3.2. So to build a seawall up to elevation five at the end of Newman Street isn't going to protect us. It'll just come over the fleet reserves back deck. So at this time, we're just building that seawall up to 3.2. So I'll give you a little bit of history. Uh, so that, talked about the um, why we're doing the project. Now I'll walk you through a little bit of the history of the project. So this is an area, aerial photograph of um, city dock area. And the areas that are outlined in blue are the areas where we see flooding. So all of Dock Street, um, we're starting to see flooding down um, in the back lot as well along the boardwalk. And then certainly all of Newman Street um, the intersection with compromise and the flooding can sometimes extend even to the um, entrance to the Annapolis Waterfront Hotel. So some of the challenges and considerations that we've um, for this project is the fact that we are, have very limited city owned property where we could actually build on. Um, we have certainly the parking lots on dock streets uh, side of uh, Market Slip, but and then we have the um, small parking lot in the 
um, adjacent to 110 Compromise, the old Fawcett's property. And then we have the Newman Park uh, par parcel, which is where this project is located. Um, all of this area is in the 100 year floodplain um, and the critical area. We're also uh, dealing with the historic district and maintaining view sheds. Um, there's a significant archeology span piece. Uh, the parcel that this site is, um, this project is going to be built on is a relatively undisturbed site. And so there's been a significant archeology span um, component to this project. And then we have um, the necessary utility infrastructure, which uh, is a necessary evil, so to speak. Um, we've considered sea level rise. While the project is not going to um, address sea level rise, it considers it. And some of the components have been um, done in such a way that they're scalable. Or for example, the wet well, which is the below grade uh, vault, we've oversized that because we only want to dig that pit once. We wouldn't want to have to, in the future, go and expand it to accommodate um, larger storms and flooding from sea level rise. And we also, through a lot of the community input, we've talked about filtration of the stormwater. So um, we are going to include some um, trash abatement structures within the catch basins that will catch not only large debris, but also um, some of the sediment will uh, settle out. So initially, uh, when this project started three years ago, we contemplated um, pump stations on both sides of Market Slip, the north side or the Dock Street side, and then on the south side uh, uh, on Compromise. There, the existing storm drain system are two uh, independent systems for those streets. They're not interconnected in any way. And so we would have, uh, we considered two separate pump stations. Um, as you can see on the right hand side of your screen, the white building is the existing um, Harbor Master building. And we contemplated putting the control, the above ground control building tucked behind that, cognizant of the fact that that is in the um, major view shed looking down Main Street. And then on the left side of the screen, the, the uh, south side pump station, uh, which we would situate in Newman Park, we looked at a couple um, locations there on either side of the basketball court. And so these are some renderings that were done initially um, to represent those two different pump stations. Um, you can see uh, on the left-hand side is the north pump station tucked behind the Harbor Master building. The architectural features of it um, mirror the contextual architecture features of the adjacent Harbor Master building. Um, and then the on the right hand side would be the south pump station, totally different architectural features and that's drawing its um, context from the adjacent uh, school buildings. So initially, uh, when we presented these two um, pump stations, we the, the, we didn't get good feedback on the north side. Uh, there was a lot of concern that um, the city dock master plan um, envisions the Harbor Master Building being removed and opening up the view shed um, through the park area. And so uh, many people expressed concern about adding yet another building in the view shed. And so at that point, we um, stepped back and, and uh, considered how can we, uh, we still need to address flooding on both sides of market slip, but um, how can we only have one building, one above ground structure? And so at that point, we considered consolidating the two pump stations just on the south side, on the compromised street side. However, with the consolidated pump station, as you can imagine, it became a much larger building. It got very bulky in mass. And the city, we struggled to find a, an acceptable solution on uh, the city property, the Newman Park property. Um, shown here are two of, I think, eight different um, renditions, the options that we looked at, different configurations of the building, um, the location in front of the basketball court at that became problematic, the, the ground is lower there. So that made the, the building taller because we have um, code requirements that um, require the electrical um, panels to be a certain elevation above the flood elevation. So um, we, again, uh, 
had to uh, rethink things. There were also, uh, we got some comments about safety concerns of uh, this large building blocking the view to the basketball court. And, um, and so we, from this, we dropped back to our original um, idea of having two separate um, pump stations. With that being said, no more work was done on the north side because shortly after that, um, uh, about two years ago, there was discussion with um, Mr. Blonder, owner of uh, what's currently Latitude 38. Um, he wanted to, he was uh, considering uh, developing a hotel on his property and uh, the city met uh, every couple of weeks with him talking about how this pump station that's required on the north side could be incorporated into his redevelopment. So uh, as not to introduce a new building. Um, and since redevelopment has was discussed, that has passed, but now there's more redevelopment being discussed more recently through the um, Urban Land Institute Technical Assistance Panel that convened two years ago and looked at the city, doc, the north side of City Dock, um, and subsequently the city convened um, a commission, the City Dock Advisory um, Group, to evaluate the recommendations that came out of that um, assistance panel. So, no work is contemplated by the city is being contemplated on the north side at this time until we determine what is going to be redeveloped and whatever redevelopment takes place on the north side will certainly take into account all of the flooding concerns and that the, those resiliency measures will be built into the redevelopment. So now this project um, is just focusing on the south side. So we needed to find a location for a, just a pump station to handle the flooding just along Compromise Street. Um, we came up with eight different options again. Um, uh, on your screen, you see four that were um, considered. Uh, starting in the upper left-hand corner um, <clears throat> was just a the basic a basic building um, at the back of the playground area. That's the highest elevation, so that would yield the the uh, shortest building. Just uh, I believe it was twelve feet in height. Um, and then uh, working clockwise around your screen, uh, we had a uh, like an L-shaped building. We had added some bathrooms. We discussed having bathrooms that came up um, in some of our community meetings, the need for restrooms um, for the children. But there was the flip side of that, there was safety concerns, security issues for securing it at night. Um, and certainly during the day uh, when the school children are on the playground. Um, and then uh, on the lower right, there was one, uh, again, a long narrow building, um, and we considered reorienting the basketball court uh, 90 degrees from how it's currently oriented. And then in your lower left was just, a, uh, again, just a straight building up against the basketball court. So um, ultimately we came up with a compromise solution that was similar. This is a sketch that was uh, developed um, at one of our meetings with the um, Anne Arundel representatives from the Anne Arundel County Public School System. So it's again, a long narrow building, but it's um, built up against, it's shown up against an existing dumpster enclosure that's uh, in the parking lot at on the school property. And so um, this is ultimately the design that we uh, settled upon and uh, we have presented in the past um, and has been uh, deemed feasible. So as you mentioned at the beginning, we've, we've been here five times before. Um, we are committed to the process. We feel like uh, each time we come, we get good feedback. Um, and I think ultimately it's, it's led to a, um, a good design, uh, one that's um, attractive and will fit in well with the uh, the context of the area. Um, and it's important to note that, um, especially in, on uh, the November 2018, that um, that was when we uh, presented this last building um, layout. And we feel we received critical consensus with the Annapolis uh, City, HPC, the public school system, and Ward 1 residents on this location and the design. Um, and I just want to emphasize that there have been no, no changes to the above ground structures, the control building, the generator enclosure since that meeting in 2018. 
So um, the big challenge is the utility infrastructure. These photos represent some of the existing uh, infrastructure around the city. Uh, starting again in the upper left-hand corner, that's a photograph of the back parking lot um, adjacent to Susan Campbell Park. Uh, the building there is uh, fondly referred to as the Bird House. Um, that house is all the electric panels that control um, the, that provide power to the um, power pedestals for all the slips in Market Slip. And in addition, there's a lot of boat, uh, provides power to the boat show panels that are situated around the perimeter of the boardwalk and the parking lot. Um, behind it, it are four transformers that sit up on a concrete pad uh, in the open. To the right is a, a photograph of a recently installed generator that's behind City Hall, uh, between City Hall and Hillman Garage. That's a 200 kilowatt generator. Uh, that's sitting in the open. It's, it's quite large, um, but it's exercised every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. And we have, in the years that it's been there, we've not received any uh, complaints about that. With that being said, this project, our project, will have a 350 kilowatt generator, which is significantly larger. And we will also enclose it. It won't be sitting out in the open. It'll be part of the control building. It'll be screened uh, from the public and have sound attenuation as well. The lower right photograph is uh, a photo of um, the recent redevelopment of 110 Compromise. And in the lower right hand, uh, hi I highlighted a transformer that uh, is there. That was part of the City Dock Bulkhead uh, replacement project that was completed in 2016. But I also wanted to highlight um, that door. That door uh, in the other square um, is a door to a, a city electrical room and that um, the developers of 110 Compromise provided space within their building to house all the electric control panels similar to the ones that are in the birdhouse down at City Dock. Um, and so that removed it from the public domain and, and out of sight. Um, we hope that something like that will happen with the redevelopment on the north side of City Dock. And then in the lower left is um, the dumpster enclosures uh, that are part of the 110 uh, compromise redevelopment. So we are certainly challenged downtown with these structures that are required, they're utilitarian, but um, we try to make them as attractive or uh, enclose them as best we can. So I just wanna wrap up this section by talking, uh, just summarizing our timeline. Um, what started this whole project back in 2016 was we received funding from the state in the amount of um, $1 million. Um, we initiated um, the design development. We contracted with AECOM and uh, uh, Wheeler Goodman Masick to develop a concept design. Um, for, uh, we also applied for a FEMA grant that year uh, for $3 million. Um, that's still pending. We've been working closely with them uh, and the Maryland Historic Trust to uh, with each evolution of this project over the years. Um, and then uh, we've done significant public outreach, as you mentioned, um, Tim. We've had city council work sessions. We've been to HPC five times. We've had two or three uh, Ward One Residents Association presentations. Um, we've gone to the Environmental Commission, as well as meetings with the public school system and various community groups, including um, the elementary school PTA and some ad hoc playground groups that use the playground. So bringing us up to today, we are uh, nearly finished our 100% design. Uh, we anticipate getting those design documents next month. Um, we've started our permitting process already and continue, anticipate continuing that through the next six months with uh, the uh, goal of uh, putting the project out for bid in November of this year and a construction start date in January of 2021. Uh, currently, um, the project is estimated to be um, about 15 to 18 months long. So uh, construction would be uh, completed by June of 2022. So um, I'm going to talk about the current status of the project now, the, the current design and um, some construction phasing. So this uh, represents, on the left is an aerial view of the existing conditions 
Um, you see Compromise Street, Newman, the Fleet Reserve, and the Newman Park um, parcel with the playground and the basketball court and the adjacent school. On the right hand side is just a um, it shows you the different components that will be part of this project and their relative location on um, the site. So the green of Compromise Street represents all the storm drain realignment and uh, the outfall pipes under Newman Street. Um, the green in the plaza area is the wet well, which is below grade. And um, we, as part of this project, we are gonna create a green space on top of that. Um, uh, along the compromise, uh, fronted, compromise Street frontage area, it will be the Guardians of the First Amendment Memorial location. And then behind that is the um, microbioretention area. Um, the basketball court remains um, as it is. The playground will be untouched throughout the duration of construction. And then the blue um, rectangular uh, shape is the control building and the uh, emergency backup generator enclosure. So this drawing is um, a plan the, from our uh, construction plans and it shows again, that same area of Compromise Street and um, Newman Street. And I just wanna em uh, emphasize that the phase one, which is outlined in red, is the area where the control building and the generator enclosure, wet well, bulkhead, and the local storm drain realignment is going to occur. And that's the, this project, the um, first phase of it, uh, will be built. And then the green, uh, the areas outlined in green are the areas of the um, additional storm drain realignment, which will be phase two. And um, this came about because of funding issues, the, the phasing of the construction. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we received a million for the design, but for construction, um, our current budget includes the $3 million FEMA grant, which is still pending, um, a city contribution of one and a half million dollars, um, we've received $2 million from the state in fiscal year 19 and most recently $750,000 as part of the state budget. We have an uh, MDE um, hazard mitigation grant uh, for $1 million for a total construction budget of $8.25 million. Now, <clears throat> we had received 95% drawings this past fall. And at that time, the construction estimate came in for the whole project, phase one and two came in at $13.5 million, nearly you know, almost double our budget. And that was what precipitated breaking the construction into two phases. So uh, to, bring, to bring it back into what we, um, our, the budget and the funding that we have on hand. So the phase two is being designed, but it will not be constructed this time. It's currently unfunded. So this is just an overview and uh, of the project as it's currently envisioned. Um, uh, in the upper right hand side, is, again, is the um, wet well, um, which will be under what's currently the brick paved uh, plaza area. We're showing ramps there up to the basketball court. Um, going up towards the upper left hand corner is the Guardians of the First Amendment Memorial. That's where that'll be located. And behind that and the wet well is the microbioretention pond. And then in the lower left-hand corner of the diagram is the area of the generator enclosure and control building. And you can see the, in the lower left, immediate, le the lower left is the existing dumpster enclosure. We're, we're building up right against that, that building. It'll, be, it'll appear as one seamless building. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott to talk to you about the archeology span efforts that have taken place um, over the last couple of years. Great, thank you very much, Lisa. Hi everybody, my name is Scott Seibold uh, with ACOM. I'm the cultural resources department manager and I'm also the uh, principal investigator um, and senior archeologist for this uh, project. I guess if we go to the next slide, please. All right, so this uh, kind of just a quick outline of of the different phases of work we have done on the uh, cultural resources side of things, but the archeological side and leading up to where we are at present. So back in 2018, what we initially 
um, prepared was what we call a phase one archaeological assessment in that we are basically you go back and do you look, we look at historic maps and do a contextual research to develop a, an understanding about the history of the property and try to identify those the, ar the archaeological resources that could potentially be uh, present and at that time we noticed from you know from sandborn maps and other mapping there used to be a number of commercial and residential structures that have been on this property. Yep, that's perfect. You can see that from the map. This is a 1908 map, but a lot of these information goes back into the 19th century. But we also know that you know, this, the history of this property extends back into the colonial times. There used to be, there was um, a number of commercial warehouse and other, and a, a tannery off to kind of the, uh, the southwest. And most of the area at the, in, up until the 1830s was actually open water. So, once you get back toward the playground, that used to be land during colonial times, and then you had water. You're, there used to be a wharf that extended out into the creek before uh, a, a large amount of fill was put out there um, in, in the, around the, the 1830s. Um, do you mind going back real quick, Lisa? Uh, sure. Mind, thank you. Yeah, just, it'll just tell me, I'll remind me, <laughs> I thought remind the my, yeah, where we are. So we, we submitted that uh, report to uh, the Maryland Historical Trust. And with you know, the assessment that there was a high potential for uh, archeological remains on the property. And we actually suggested that these were twofold. We know that um, from archeological work that happened in the playground area back in the 1980s, that there were archeological deposits back there, including the potential for uh, colonial era, era deposits. We also knew that based on the mapping that we had, that we had 19th and 20th century uh, residential and commercial deposits, but also in the area that has been, was filled in the 1830s. We know not only historically was there a wharf that extended out somewhere on the property, we don't have a good location about where it was, but also there's in areas that if, where you have fill, a lot of times you find that historically that you had ships that were scuttled to uh, provide basically a foundation for this fill stability. Uh, if anybody's familiar with what's happened in Alexandria over the past few years, that the, the work that they've done for a hotel down in, in downtown uh, Alexandria, and they found the remains of three ships that had been scuttled to um, stabilize the fill that was placed there. That is something that we, you know, it was a concern that, that the, there is a, the chance of, of also, kind of like we say, maritime archaeological deposits on the site. Uh, Maryland Historical Trust agreed with us about the, um, the archaeological potential of the property and kind of following on that we conducted some additional work. This was an archaeological geophysical survey uh, using both ground penetrating ra radar and electromagnetic uh, was, uh, survey and we also have examined geotechnical borings that had taken place on the property uh, or around the property in support of the project before. And if you actually, uh, Lisa, if you could forward back and we could go to the one, the geophysical map. So right there, this is actually a really good, this is uh, from about two to three feet deep. So these are from, uh, from the, the survey and you can see some really interesting things. So first of those, those green squares are, are test units that we excavated during the, the phase two evaluation that I'll get to. But you can notice some interesting things. The, in the kind of Southeastern corner, it's all very blue. There's very few of what we call anomalies in that area. Um, and then in the areas where you can see where our test units, we have a number of anomalies that are present, some really you know, yellow and orange colors indicating high returns. And you see that actually underneath the basketball court as well. And that plus the geophysical, I mean, the geotechnical borings that we examined kind of gave us indications of a number of things. One, we, we know that where the brick plaza is and that's where the blue remains are. It's at a lower elevation than the, the garden area is and the lack of returns in there suggests that there's basically there's no remains um, probably present or very little in the way of remains from the buildings that used to be present there that were demolished back in the mid 20th century. Uh, the area is definitely is lower in elevation. It looks like it's been pretty well cleared and scraped and we assess that that area probably has a pretty low potential to contain any significant archaeological resources at least po uh, post 1830. Um, there's still the potential for, for deep deposits from the maritime, to, you know, related to the maritime history 
of Annapolis, as I said, the wharf and possibly, you know, hopefully not, but there's always the potential for maybe a scuttled ship down there as fill st st stabilizing the fill. And, but the geophysical returns gave us a lot of indications that there were a number of large, highly reflective anomalies within the, the garden and underneath the basketball court. And we know that the, the basketball court is built on some fill and we were, you know, thought that the same would probably be true for the garden area as well. So based on the work that we did in that kind of phase 1B report, again, it kind of narrowed our focus a little bit. So we were able to say that, you know, there's, we think there's a, that low potential for these post-1830 deposits under the brick plaza, but it's still a high potential as indicated by the geophysical uh, survey information in the rest of uh, the project area. Another interesting thing that the geotechnical borings do show is that you could, there's a thick layer of, if I, you know, of clay or clay fill that showed up in the borings. And as you moved basically farther away from the creek and towards the playground, the thickness of those fill layers became thinner and thinner and thinner. So you could basically see the base of the historic, you know, um, creek bottom as it came up onto dry land. So there was some interesting, you could, you could see those deposits, if I remember correctly, may have extended up to about 20 feet uh, in depth. Um, so if, Lisa, if you don't mind going back to that timeline slide again. All right, and so following that again, we've submitted that to Maryland Historical Trust and then again, they uh, recommended additional like actual archeological investigations to evaluate the National Register of Historic Places uh, eligibility of the site. The work that was done back in the 1980s, back in the playground area, had suggested that there was, that the, the site encompasses, you know, the whole parcel and was potentially eligible for the National Register, but it had not gone to make, there had been no formal um, recommendation and no more formal archeological work. And this certainly in this, this portion to uh, give us an idea about what the uh, deposits were present. So we went back in 2019 um, and co conducted uh, a phase two archeological evaluation. And the whole, that includes the excavation. You can see one right there. This is very close to where the control building uh, would be. So where we dig, you know, three foot by three foot square uh, test units in a controlled manner to get a better idea about the, the stratigraphy or the different layers of soil and archeological deposits that are present and to determine if there are any preserved archeological features in these areas. Um, and I guess we could kind of forward back to some of the results of that work, which is very interesting. So we can see here, these are a couple of units here. These were in the area that probably corresponds more or less to where the, uh, the, the bioretention pond is. And we have two things. One, you could see on feature four, this is a, a the remains of a brick wall preserved under a number of layers of fill. It's quite intact. It's, uh, there's very little uh, damage to it. So that's probably that, that corresponds to what we look like the rear of one of the buildings that's shown on the Sanborn maps. If you go on features two and three, this is very interesting. Those, you know, the, the hatched parts that you see and that are outlined in white dotted lines, those actually preserved wood. So our interpretation of that is there's a good chance that this actually um, represents a preserved privy um, and maybe a two hole privy, but that this is at the back of one of the, of the residential buildings that were on the Sanborn map. And there's, again, you can see there, it's hard to see in that the wall of that unit, but there's a lot of various levels of uh, layers of fill that have been placed on the area. They, you know, they contain, you know, mid 19th to nearly modern uh, materials mixed in, but there's amazing preservation then underneath that. Um, privies are, are a really important archaeological feature because of the uh, sort of remains that they um, contain. The historical records show that, you know, what people say that they like to eat and do you know, certainly pales in comparison to what their garbage and what they would throw down in privies show that they actually did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that goes to the present day. There's a big study in Arizona where the people were looking through uh, modern trash dumps to see, to... <laughs> and doing surveys of people and people saying about what they ate and what they drank and then the, the, uh, the landfill proved otherwise. <laughs> but we could go on, uh, if you wanna go on Lisa and I can show some of the other bits. These are just some uh, examples of some of the artifacts that, that were recovered um, on the left, test unit one. That was, you saw the picture of somebody digging a test unit and then the area of the control building. This is, that's the area where it was what we would call upland during the colonial period. 
and some of the artifacts that we have on there is the white salt, salt glazed stoneware that's a colonial era artifact. Frameware is an artifact you, you find in the late 18th century. Pearlware kind of spans that time between you know late 18th, early 19th century before you uh, whiteware became a, a more in something that, which is actually you find on plates and stuff today. But a lot of these artifacts are, are completely at um, in accordance with what we expected to find in terms of time periods. So we have you know 18th to early 19th century. Um, remains from you know, pipe stems, you know, a marble, bowls and plates and cups, nails, things of that nature. Um, the ones on the right are from Testament two and three. This is the one that, that had the, uh, the privy in it. And these are, you know, more artifacts that you'd expect from the time period you're looking at 19th to early 20th century from this time period. So I think we might have some other uh, examples of Artifacts, yep. Again, same things as we go down. Uh, again, uh, you can see the, the type of, we're getting whole bottles, porcelain doll heads, a large number of slate pencils. Those are, would have been used usually for as writing utensils on, literally on slates. Um, so those, you know, you, oftentimes those have been used by school children, uh, school-aged children, numerous keys, buttons, um, things of that nature. So there's a lot of kind of good, really uh, detailed archeological artifacts coming out that really speak to the personal lives of the people who used to live on these properties. And I don't remember what we had on the next slide. All right, so we could go back to, oh, we could come back to that in a second and we can go back, <laughs> sorry, to that original uh, timeline again, and then we could go to back to that final one. So basically at the end, uh, what the, at the end of the phase two, what we do, we analyze the, the data that we've collected to date, not all from the archaeological data plus the historical contextual data that we've uh, collected. Um, and then we evaluate, use those, that information to try to evaluate the site um, according to the National Register uh, criteria for eligibility. Um, this one usually gets under data. It's, um, that's the main archaeological criteria. And there's obviously, we could tell there's intact features. There's a, a wide array of artifacts that are, speak to the, the personal lives of the people who resided here. We have artifacts that date to, you know, from the 18th century to the time when the area was uh, taken over by the city and the, the, the buildings demolished. Um, we also have that the area, the historical contextual data is very interesting too, because a number of the people who used to live here in the late 19th to early 20th century were immigrants directly related to uh, the Naval Academy in the US Navy. So there's a, a real interesting thing there. You have an, a, a port town, you have the Naval connection, you have uh, you know, immigrant families moving to the area because of that connection. So you have, there's a, a lot more hist rich historical data that could be gleaned from this site, not just from the purely from the artifacts and the features, but uh, historical records about the people who actually lived here. We were able to glean a lot of information from the, uh, the US census records, for instance. Um, at the, because of all this information, we recommended that the site is eligible for listing in the National Register. And uh, we submitted that uh, in our report to the Maryland Historical Trust. They concurred with that recommendation, determined that the site is eligible. And that's almost where we are right now. Now we're at the point kind of from the regulatory side of things where the work we were doing previously was related more to um, the state regulatory process, but also in anticipation of the, the FEMA funding. The FEMA, FEMA funding and their involvement in this uh, turns this into basically a federalized project. Uh, FEMA is what we consider the lead federal agency for that. And now this, their involvement triggers section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, as part of that, FEMA and Maryland Historical Trust have to come to an agreement that one, FEMA has to, you know, they have to concur that one, yes, the site, you know, they concur with MHD that the site is eligible, but two, more importantly, they will now are in the process of concurring that this site is, they will determine that there will be an adverse effect from this project on this National Register uh, eligible site. So an adverse effect from, a, uh, from an undertaking like this means that there is going to be some need for um, archaeological mitigation of the remains. Uh, there are 
There is actually FEMA and MHT and some other state agencies and uh, that uh, Indian tribes are have or are signatories to a programmatic agreement that out, kind of outlines how to address impacts to you know adverse effects to historic properties. And one of those is what they call is a uh, treatment. They call them treatment measures. And one of the treatment measures is the typical um, treatment that you do use to uh, mitigate uh, adverse effects to archaeological sites, which is the phase three archaeological data recovery. The point we are right now that we have submitted the phase two report to FEMA. FEMA has reviewed it. They have now submitted their recommendations in terms of I know the effects on the undertaking to the site to Maryland Historical Trust. MHT is currently reviewing those right now, and we expect that in the next couple of weeks, hopefully, that we'll have uh, MHT's letter um, working out that, yes, there's an adverse effect to the site, and it's time now to kind of move forward in the process. Um, the next step that we're expecting to do once that happens is to start the preparing a data recovery plan. That's a plan that outlines uh, the way in which the archaeological data recovery would proceed and collect the significant data that would be uh, destroyed um, by construction of the project. And there will be some back and forth between FEMA, MHT, and other consulting parties about the, the process for that. But that's kind of where we are to date. And I guess we can go finally to that final slide, Lisa, because I could show that kind of highlights some of our recommendations just that we're providing, provided to MHT. You can see we have two areas here, basically one kind of in a light brown and the other in blue. The light brown areas for the most part are those areas where the geophysical survey showed almost no um, anomalous returns. So the, that's the area that we're expecting that there's actually um, very little to no potential for any of the post-1830 um, buildings that used to be present on the property. Um, and then in the blue are the areas where we know we have units that we dug in the control building, the biotension pond and near the memorial that show that there are preserved archeological features underneath multiple layers of fill, um, historical artifacts, things of that nature. So that's what we're recommending just to kind of at a higher level, this doesn't address kind of like the real nitty gritty about where you would place test units or things of that nature, but we're recommending the archeological data recovery activities occur within the blue areas, and we're recommending archaeological monitoring for the brown air areas. You'll see a set, there is a section going underneath through the basketball court where we're recommending monitoring, and that's basically because we don't want to tear up the basketball court unnecessarily. Um, so while construction would be occurring in that area, we'd have an archaeological monitor uh, on present to record any archaeological features that were uh, encountered. In the wet well area, is, that's really more looking for the potential for uh, buried maritime resources, uh, mainly the remains of the wharf, potentially the remains of a scuttled ship, things of that nature. So that's basically where we are uh, to date. I don't know if there's uh, if anybody has any questions or if Lisa, you have anything you'd like to follow up on. Yeah, I, I'd like to jump in. This is Tim. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, this is fascinating. Um, turn of events on this particular project, which has been going on for a long time. We all, I think we were aware from the Sandburn that this was a very developed area and had lots of potential and obviously it has. So I actually had um, two questions for you. And um, first of all, I'm curious, and this would be educational, the whole historic district is on the National Register already. Mm -hmm. So is this a, an archaeological register that's different? Well, it's the, so this, the, yeah, it's actually, it's the same. The, it's, this is specific to the archaeological site itself. Okay, that's, that, that's new that's great information. That's yes, good. exactly, yeah. So, I mean, it's possible that the archaeological site could also contribute to the eligibility of the district, but as a standalone resource, it is in and of itself, it's eligible. Well, we're already kind of there. We're already yeah. a nationalist there. Yeah. District. So, um, so that's one question. The other is, um, did you find things that were unique or not found in other areas of downtown Annapolis? There's been lots of archaeology in downtown Annapolis. Did you find things that were that comparatively were un relatively unique? Oh, we haven't found this in underneath this parking lot, which is <laughs> you know, which is a lot of times and things are found. So, yeah, did for, you find from... things that were. 
from the materials that I, I have, yeah, from the materials that I've reviewed, and at least in just the general vicinity, we didn't do a, a wide range uh, assessment of you know archaeological investigation that have occurred across Annapolis. And I think the, the biggest thing on this to me is the, the fact that you know, like the, the the wood, the preserved wood, um, and that's suggestion of a privy. That's I don't know of other ones that close by where potential privy features have been been found. Um, I think that the fact that there's a, the potential that we, I can't say it's, a, it's potential, so it's not found, but the actual historic maritime features that may be present, that's a lot of the other areas were, were upland areas, you know, historically, and they were not areas that had been filled in. So, or at least the, the deposits weren't, you know, the uh, work didn't go deep enough that there would have been potential impacts to um, features that could have been buried in, in marine, in the fill layers and historic fill. So I think that's that's something different. I mean, there's been work, plenty of work kind of along Compromise Street where there's been found like, you know, um, buried remains of plank roads and things like that. But a lot of the work hasn't gone deep enough or at least wasn't through the, through the archaeology, through the, the regulatory process that it would have been, anybody would have been actually paying attention <laughs> for those sorts of remains. I think the immigrant connection too is actually to me probably one of the more fascinating parts of it. Um, not necessarily the features themselves, but the historical uh, occupants of the area. Um, Tim, I have a question. Yeah, so I just, we're going to, Lisa, if you don't mind, we're just going to open it up a little bit for uh, commissioner questions before you proceed. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Pat. Okay. Um, uh, for Scott, so I, so you, you said that, um, uh, the blue portion will trigger a data recovery plan. But what does that mean? Where does all this, then all of this go to? And it sounds like there's a, a, a very interesting story to tell, very relevant to Annapolis, to the Naval Academy, to immigration at the time. So what happens with all this? And um, how do we tell this story? Yeah, well, a lot of times data recovery plans have a public education and outreach component to them. So it's not like it stays you know, buried in the great literature of cultural resource management. So as part of the data recovery plan, we would have to work um, not only with FEMA and MHT, but consulting parties, the city itself, um, to determine what methods we would use to, to exactly to tell the story. A lot of times, I mean, common items are, you know, public websites, uh, educational signage that would go on the site. Um, sometimes you put together educational plans that go out to, you know, to schools. Um, there's, there's a whole wide range of, of different things that could be investigated as part of, you know, the public education and outreach component of the data recovery. Mm -hmm. so. so shouldn't, if, especially if there's any on-site educational um, components to this, shouldn't this then, wouldn't this, of necessity be included in the final plan when it comes before us? Or I guess I'm saying, I think it should be. I, I just think this is really a kind of, a, you know, a fascinating story. And again, very relevant to that area in, uh, in Annapolis. Yeah, I'd, I'd say for on the plan side, I guess there's, you know, from, I don't know what you all would review as part as a commission in terms of the data recovery plan or versus are you talking about the plan that the, the city brings back to you in terms of, of the well the, anything I, I what i should say is or what i'm saying is anything that's going to be on the site mm -hmm. um will be reviewed by us now yeah. you can say well you know none of this will be on the site and then my question is well maybe some of it should be because, yeah. um, and obviously it's something you don't know at this time, but um, I just think that's a, that's a very, again, an important um, story and a relevant story to tell um, in, yeah. in that area. Particularly the elementary school people walking by this every day. Oh, definitely. Um, I think from a uh, right path, I completely agree. From an application, we would the applicant some guidance, you would want to tell us where potential educational panels 
or, or potentially any kind of educational things. We don't need to, to decide or ask you to provide the details, but you would want to include those. And any interpretive um, information also would need to go before the Heritage Commission, who is important. So Roberta, it, Roberta would be very involved mm -hmm. in, in um, reviewing the eventual content of those. All right, Roberta. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's a tremendous storm going on here, which probably is affecting the connection as well. Um, yes, and as I as I understand it, um, whenever there is Section 106, then uh, the city is also part of um, the team that comments. Yes. On on the adverse effect. Yeah, and correct. that you know we can always uh, condition that as well in an application. So section one hundred six is a federal um, statute about adverse effects. Is, is are we getting involved in that because FEMA is involved in funding here? Yeah. So is FEMA is the trigger oh. for for section one hundred six? <laughs> light, yeah. light bulb just went on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but at the same time, just because it's a federal, you know, regulatory process that, you know, the, the city would be a consulting party and actually on sure, sure. to this yeah, and be, absolutely. you know, intimately involved in the in the formulation of the data recovery plan. Yes, but normally it's wonderful to have this level of detail. And so now I understand the section 106 is involved here and MHT is involved directly, more directly than in other projects that we have. So now I've put two and two together. Yeah, but I think one of the other things I think, and just on, on the educational side, the fact that it is in a public area, I mean, I yep. don't know what, when the work occurs and you know, potential things related to, you know, COVID-19, um, but typically you would open this and to actually be allowed for, you know, people coming by, you know, oftentimes in, in urban areas, we have urban sites that are, you know, with high accessibility to the public, um, tours by, by schools, uh, yeah. an archaeologist on site who occasionally gives, you know, a discussion to people, you know, maybe every couple hours about, you know, five, 10 minute discussion about what they're doing and what they're finding. Those are all common yeah. things that, you know, that you find idea. on sites like this. Yeah. Or even, you know, utilizing um, archaeological uh, volunteers as part of the data recovery process is something else that could be done too. And it also would be something that could help on the cost uh, side of things. Yes. In the 90s, archaeology yeah. in Annapolis, Yep. had all of those things and we're still dealing with all the artifacts yeah <laughs> you gotta make sure you structure in such a way we, that it you know <laughs> we don't know what to do with what we found already yeah <laughs> and none of it's well this is another discussion uh, a longer discussion i think about what we do with what you what you find so yep. other commissioners comments on the archaeology I have a, um, it, are we taking comments or questions for lisa greco now or is that later no, I think what, what we interrupted her presentation. I just um, so I think we'll let her go on um, okay. because she's not finished, and then we'll come back. Okay, Pat. Okay. I just thought the archaeology stuff was wonderful, yeah. but tangential yeah. to the rest. Um, uh, Kim Finch also advised me that she needs to leave about now, so she's going to have to leave the meeting. Okay, Lisa. Okay. And then what we'll do, Lisa, when you're done, we'll ask Roberta for some of her comments and then we'll provide the commissioners will provide the feedback on okay. um, everything. Thank you. You're Actually, welcome. Tim, I'm going to yeah. say that I'm, I'm going to, my other meeting has been rescheduled, so I'm sticking around because this is oh, that's, fascinating. So, that's great. so uh, that's I'm glad you. I'm able to stay because it's, this is, there's so much information available. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm glad I felt sorry for you. I had to go off to an eight o'clock PM meeting. <laughs> which you've probably been working since eight o'clock this morning. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Good um, news. So next, we're going to continue. Um, the, uh, Ed Masick will present the architecture of the control building and generator enclosure. Thank you. Um, we're going to transition now from what is uh, below the ground to the one of the few uh, structures in this project that's above the ground. Um, the, um, I want to talk a little bit uh, just quickly about um, the sensitivity that we had on the project to the view corridors 
specifically for the um, the utilitarian or the sort of infrastructure structures that we had to incorporate in the project. Um, go ahead, Lisa. Um, so uh, first, uh, the main view corridor uh, for this side of the uh, of the market slip is Compromise Street, and um, we were pleased that we were able to site these buildings um, with the help of the Board of Education, as Lisa mentioned earlier, uh, in such a way that they are as um, in an, in intrusive as they possibly can be, um, and still house the um, uh, the features and the equipment that needs to be um, placed above ground and out of flood and harm's way for the project. You can keep going. So I'll just quickly walk uh, the members around uh, the site. As you know, this is a very open site. It's a public um, park. The playground is on the uphill side. The basketball court is in the middle and then the hardscape plaza is um, along the street of Compromise uh, Street. Keep going. Just to give you the existing context. Uh, if you could stop here, just, oops, one second, go back, Lisa. Uh, one of the benefits that uh, being able to work this um, building um, up against the existing school's dumpster enclosure is that we have this um, sort of no man's land zone here where the, the, the space was uh, being utilized. It's a, a two level um, site, the basketball courts on the low level, the uh, school properties on a higher level and we're gonna be able to take advantage of that um, uh, space in order to nestle uh, the control building and the generator um, in this location, which really has zero impact on the playground, the basketball court once it's restored after construction, and of course the, the hardscape plaza um, along compromise. Go ahead. This just shows you the, um, the details. Uh, yep, keep going. No, that worked, didn't it? Yeah, there you go. Um, the one thing about um, utilizing some of the, the uh, features of the new school project, which was built in, um, uh, finished in 2015, I think, um, is the fact that they spent a lot of time, and I'm sure it was uh, past HPC commission members who were reviewed this project that, that brought some of these um, great um, details to the project, even on their uh, support structures and their retaining walls and things like that. So we have a very good palette of materials that we're able to work with. Um, and we're very pleased that we'll be able to integrate our building um, in this location and pick up many of the design cues and material cues you see here. Um, a lot of them, they were great to work with and they, they had lots of ideas. They, unfortunately, I think this shows that they were going to plant some stuff here and have it grow against the wall. And yeah, they had um, they had a live a living wall scheme going here. I don't think um, the board of ed actually uh, uh, took care of that because nothing ever nothing ever took. It's uh, no. It, it, it looked. I mean, the brickwork. They were very willing to put nice brick. Right. There, so. so go ahead, Lisa. So this just walks around the other side, um, just so everyone has um, a sense of context. We're standing on the school's parking lot at this point. Um, keep going. And then uh, pulling away, this would be um, sort of the backside of, 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 of our building. I think it's important to note here that in addition to the school board providing um, a portion of their property for us to build the our building on it and up against their existing uh, dumpster enclosure. They're also going to provide the city with the um, operational aspects. They're going to be able to access this um, this building from the school board proper, property 
So maintenance crews and, um, and any emergency activities that have to occur during a flood event, they can access the building through this parking lot. We will not have to provide um, access from That's Newman true. Street, which I think is a great, a great thing. We were worried about where we were gonna have to park service vehicles. Um, and they're also gonna allow us to use part of this parking lot for construction staging on a temporary basis. Um, during the summertime. So um, all of that is, is a very positive outcome from the negotiations. Okay, Lisa. So um, we talked about, um, we couldn't have found a better spot. The, the control building is, is notched back into this back corner. Uh, the views from the playground across the basketball court out to Compromise Street are preserved. Um, this is very important from the, um, the citizens that use the playground in the basketball court, but it's also important from the school because they, they use the basketball court and the playground for their uh, recess yards. And so the teachers, uh, when they bring students out here, they need visual control over um, uh, multiple kids on multiple uh, playground venues. Um, and so this, this gives them um, unfettered uh, supervisory and, and visual uh, connection to the students. And, um, and we, don't, we don't impact anything with our, with our building on the permanent basis going forward. The other thing I wanna mention, I think Lisa wants me to just to mention that um, the way the site's bifurcated our incoming utilities, because we have to bring duct banks and, and gas lines and things to the control building, will come up the space between the school parking lot, uh, which is marked on the left side of the diagram, and a, um, an existing stone wall. So coming in from Compromise Street, our utilities will come up through um, that slot in the um, in the property, you'll see a, a, a placeholder there for a new bg &E transformer, which is um, tucked about halfway up from the street. And then outgoing uh, connections, the outgoing duct banks and other uh, telemetry that goes down to the pump and the wet well will go across and be buried under the basketball court and eventually find its way to the wet well uh, where the uh, reinforced turf uh, grass is, is going to sit on top of it. So I think the, um, the archaeology we heard about a few minutes ago um, will fortunately be able to mitigate um, a lot of this underground construction activity. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, I won't read through all of these um, bullets, but, but essentially we heard earlier that our building must be at elevation eight, which is three feet above the, uh, the flood elevation established uh, at five by, um, by FEMA and the flood maps. Um, the dumpster enclosure, just by coincidence, is at an elevation of about 7.8. So it was a perfect match for those two buildings. They even have this almost the same identical um, floor slabs in them. And so they match up very well. Um, our problem is when you start a building at eight foot high and you put in large pieces of, of electrical switch gear that are seven and a half feet tall and a generator that's nine feet tall, we need um, you know high walls to, in order to enclose those. And, um, and, and the, the height of the dumpster enclosure at about 12 foot six uh, also worked out to be um, a good, uh, a good neighbor and a good uh, context for us to unite the two structures into one. Okay. Uh, this is just showing some details that uh, we had previously talked to you about back in November of 18 of where we're picking up many of our uh, architectural uh, themes in context uh, for the, for our building. Go ahead. The other thing uh, the commission members wanted back in November of 18 is they, they asked if we could at least show context of, of new construction that's occurring um, 
in the area. I mean, we drew a lot on what this, this, the public school project um, offered, and that's our primary driver in terms of, of context for our building. But when we started our project, um, both 9 St. Mary's and 110 Compromise Street were in design. <laughs> and in the three and a half years that's taken us to get to where we are now, um, both are finished, uh, which is fine. Uh, this was the context. This is, you know, right across the street from us on Newman Street. This is their new parking garage, uh, which has a, a, a cornice line of about a little over 12 feet. Um, next slide. Um, the other data point was compromise. Um, that's a, a larger structure and, and uh, sort of the building datum there was at 184. Um, on our project, keep going, Lisa. So on our project on the um, on the basketball court side, um, we are at um, approximately 15 feet uh, 10 inches from the um, the basketball court surface to the top of our parapet. On the back side, um, which is on the on the board of ed parking lot side we're just slightly over uh, 12 feet because of the grade changes. Um, this is the elevations. These are both the elevations that you saw and had uh, favorably received back in November of 18 when we brought them to the, uh, the last pre-app. Um, again, these are, it's, a, it's an unoccupied structure. It's, a, it's a basically a uh, meant to be impervious both from a security standpoint and also from a, a flood standpoint because of what's housed in it. And um, go, just go back one, Lisa. And so, you know, we tied, tied this all together. Um, this was the elevation that the commission members back in November of 18 felt was um, of the ones we showed, um, you know, uh, was the most feasible and uh, and and that's the one we're we're continuing to to go forward with and that's what our 100% drawings are now based on um, click on Lisa I don't know if there's anything else uh, this is just the Annapolis blend brick we were able to match um, what's on the dumpster this is our palette so we have the Annapolis blend brick and Flemish bond. We have the precast. We have uh, a black standing seam roof over the control building. We have uh, black painted railings on our handrails and um, downspouts. And we have the uh, terracotta paint on our um, two doors, one going into the control building and one going into the generator enclosure. And our light fixtures, we have two light uh, dark sky friendly light fixtures. They will also be black. One's over the control building door. The other one will be over the elevator, uh, the uh, generator enclosure door. Uh, they are LED. They are, as I said before, dark sky friendly. Um, they have very low cutoff um, because um, we do need some security in case the staff has to access the buildings uh, during a um, during an event, um, a storm event or something, and and be able to get get to the equipment. So the. Could I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, those are the only. There's, there's, are there other light lighting aspects to the uh, the building itself, or is that? I mean, there probably are lighting aspects to other landscape plays, to, uh, um, other landscape features, but th this is just pertains to the building, right? Right. Well, these are these are more um, security for for being for personnel to be able to get in the building and, over, and, over the doors. Yeah, um, there is a uh, um, a parking lot light immediately um, adjacent to the dumpster that illuminates uh, generally the area. Where you can see it. Go back one or go forward one. I'm sorry. Oh, my pop. You can see it there, uh, Lisa. Yeah. Maybe you can yeah. point yeah. to the to yeah. the light there. And there's also um, lights on the tennis court, but I, I don't think they're they're going to be uh, operational at any 
basketball time court. except when that's being used. You said tennis court, but um, I mean basketball court. Right. Do you know it used to be tennis courts? I know it is, and and I uh, yeah. I keep uh, I keep referring to it. I had the uh, original yeah. drawings from yeah, the city. Some great photographs. There were tennis courts there before. So one of our comments way back when, in one of our meetings, was a a more deep overall more detailed lighting design. <clears throat> Maybe that we'll get to the 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 other landscape features but i just wanted to remind you that additional landscape or additional lighting um design was asked for in a year ago or so two years ago well who knows <laughs> are you tim are you thinking about on the building itself or just in no, the in the area i i think um probably the benches any of the benches are going to be lighted eventually we'll talk about the mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the memorial um so when when we get to a final application, a comprehensive lighting design would be needed. I'm just kind of jumping ahead and signaling that sure. that'll probably be take away. Right. So Lisa, keep clicking through just to make sure uh, I want to move on so they can see the memorial. Well, great. So that was it. I know you had seen it before, but this was just a refresher. Um, and there's there's good stuff to come on the rest of this presentation. So I will. Uh, I will adjourn. And so the next section, we're going to talk about the hardscape and landscape in the plaza area. And this will be presented by Romaine Kessiger. Good evening. We'll start looking at the north side of the park at Compromise Street. And there is an existing concrete sidewalk along Compromise with a brick paver border between the curb and the sidewalk. And we will be salvaging brick and replacing that. So the sidewalk as shown will match up to what is existing. The wet well is a major feature in the park and it's a rare and unique opportunity for some green space. So it will be sodded turf and we'll have reinforcement and we'll show you a photo of that in a moment. The, oh, uh, in the lower left photo, there is a sample of core grass, a proprietary type of reinforcement. And this will allow heavy use of the sod area for any events and protect the turf from wearing out. Going back to the site plan, there are existing light fixtures or pedestrian or street lights, decorative type along Compromise and Newman. Uh, all the lighting will be salvaged and replaced. Within the wet well area, there are personnel hatches for uh, individuals to be able to access the wet well when needed on rare occasions. And those are represented by the five small rectangles there are three larger rectangles that are major access hatches for uh, the items that are located within the wet well. And those will be precast panels and they'll have a light exposed aggregate finish. The smaller personnel hatches will have a brick infill that will use a thin veneer of the paver brick within the hatch lid itself. There will be a low wall around the wet well, a set of steps to the upper level of the park. And uh, all of this will be ADA. There are no ramps. It's, it is sloped 5% uh, or less for ADA. Going around uh, the pavers or, or the paved area, the basketball court is shortened a little bit, but it will be utilized as a staging area during construction. It will also have some major trenching through it for the utilities. So it will be uh, demolished and the asphalt replaced with a new course of asphalt and new paint markings. And we're salvaging the basketball goals and replacing those. The existing stone wall will be rebuilt to match the existing to the left 
just to the north of the control building. We are retaining as many trees as we can, the oaks in the upper left, uh, and there's a Chinese elm, a long Newman, a sawtooth oak, and at the generator enclosure, we're protecting two large mature Osage orange trees. The new landscaping will utilize native plant materials as primarily to address requirements of the critical area commission for the needed planting to provide for uh, the approvals for the consistency report for the critical area commission. And uh, the existing seat wall will have a similar design. The brick will match the brick selection from the control building. And there will be concrete or precast concrete coping on the wall. Next slide shows an ornamental real quick decorative. Um, and it'll have skateboard protection on top of it. <laughs> we noted your existing skateboard <laughs> protection and it is not proposed at this point. Okay, and, well, it's not in my, it's not necessarily in our purview, but I, I, I noted it too. So it might be something for Lisa to think about. The next slide will uh, show the decorative hand railing that will be used at the step area. And there's uh, that's the only handrail within the site. Uh, so the landscape plant selection, again, utilizes native species. And there really isn't any ornamental plant material in this area, but it is a selection of plants that are uh, tolerant of the conditions there, don't need irrigation, and the park will be sodded wherever it's disturbed and not paved. So some of the plant materials uh, from the Eastern Redbud, Inkberry, Itea, River Birch and Aster and Black-Eyed Susan, all native materials. We have a microbioretention in the middle of the park and that does replace the rain garden that exists there now, but the microbioretention helps or does provide the needed stormwater management and water quality for this area of the park. And this is a list of the microbioretention plants and uh, I won't read the whole list, but if you have any questions, we can answer those for you. And a variety of plants have been selected to provide interest throughout the year. Uh, low maintenance as well. Moody Grand. I'll bring up um, just one again, bringing forward some of our previous comments from um, uh, previous hearings, the maintenance of the grass itself, the sod itself, and the bioretention area. I just want to put this on Lisa's um, radar uh, that that would be important for us to understand that that's been included um, in the management plan for the parks. I don't know parks. I don't know who's responsible, but as you know, we go back and forth. Oh, we're we're responsible up to this point and. It ends up becoming um, not maintained. So be, I think it would be great, Lisa, if in your eventual application you could say you had discussions and had, I, I know it's difficult budget wise, but how, how this would fall into the park and recs plan. Because eventually it's going to go to them, right? This is not a uh, public. Yeah. It would be, yes. Okay. I just pulled that forward from previous meetings. Thank you. Oh, this is Roberta. I have a question. Can you go back, please, to the decorative handrail? The 
can't hear you, Roberta. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I was waiting for the photo of the uh, drawing of the handrail. Um, uh, can you tell me what the source of the uh, decorative finial is? What is the source of that design? And the commission might want to weigh in on the feasibility of having that decorative feature. Uh, Plus the, the lamb's very, tongue at the end. At the very top is the name of a company, one company or approved equal that we could use. And that finial has an acorn top with a decorative leaf uh, design to it. And we can select uh, any finial that you might want to look at and it's open to a selection. So it does not have to be that exact finial. That would be a very simple, um, I think you should propose what you'd like. Um, it, it, it almost, it's, I know it's a minor, minor detail, but keeping things ex quite simple and not to um, create any false sense of historical feature. So it's, it's a simple, I guess what I'm saying, the simpler, the better. <laughs> would other commissioners agree? Uh, well, staff agrees. <laughs> okay, there you go. Lamb's tail, the lamb's tongue end is pretty simple, but you wouldn't want to put it in anything that creates a, a symbol. Though we have an interesting choice, acorn. We have a big, the big acorn on the top of the state house is very interesting, but simpler, the better, because this is a brand, brand new installation. So. Do you, you have any uh, observation about the finial otherwise? Should there be finials or we can eliminate that feature. Well, we, we don't dictate design, but I'm just saying it should be simple, so. We understand. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, regarding the landscaping? Okay, if not, then we we'll proceed. Um, next up is the um, Memorial, the Guardians of the First Amendment Memorial, which will be presented by Jay Graham. He's the memorial designer. Uh, evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, this is the uh, site plan everybody's been looking at tonight. You're probably used to it by now. Uh, so the memorial is the last piece that became part of this uh, whole park. So the um, <clears throat> the shooting at the Capitol is two years ago, this coming Sunday. And about six months after that, the Dr. Martin Luther King Committee uh, wanted to create a memorial. They went to the city and asked for a, a place on city land. And they also asked us to help them uh, visualize what this memorial might be. So it, at first we were we created some uh, options uh, on a pro bono basis. And then uh, we showed those initial designs to um, the uh, owners of the Capitol, the Baltimore Media Group. And they came up with a, uh, in conversations, we came up with a, a narrative that said that, yeah, that their idea is the journalists did not want to be the feature of a memorial, but that they are part of the community. And uh, that's where the, the notion that they're part of the community, but they're the guardians of the First Amendment. So if you, um, Lisa could go to, well, the next picture will be the site itself. And the next picture will be the plan. So, um, the bald cypress trees, this grove of trees is represents the community and the five pillars represent the guardians of the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is, is a granite plaque on this brick curving wall. Uh, 
so it, it's the focal point of the space. Uh, at least if you go to the next one, there's an elevation. So here you see a, a wall that the straight part of the wall is about seven foot nine inches with a 12 inch cap. And then you have these uh, granite pillars. Um, I think the next picture will show you uh, our inspiration for the bald cypress. This is that small pocket park within the first block of uh, West Street. And these are all bald cypress growing up um, among buildings. So they've lost some of their lower branches. Ours would not lose their lower branches, but we were, um, we used the spacing here to give us some ideas on how to space the grove of trees around the, the memorial. The next picture also shows uh, that it's hard not to walk around Annapolis without seeing brick walls everywhere you go. Uh, the one on the left is the back of the Chase Lloyd house. The one on the right is a small fragment of wall on Prince George Street. And the next uh, slide. You, uh, the upper left is one uh, behind the state office buildings. The lower left is the uh, Hammond Harwood house. And the, the one on the right is the Paker Garden. So there are walls all over town. So it seemed like we were assembling a language, a landscape language from the walls and the bald cypress trees to create um, this, this monument. And so the one really different thing is, is the granite uh, that we use as, uh, at least I think the next picture is, all right. So the first amendment is uh, carved in a granite relief on the brick wall, but then the paving is, and the piers are all the same granite, but in different finishes. And the next picture will show you how you can take the same granite and depending on how you finish it, it can look quite different. So um, the inscription panel is smoother. The, the pillars are, are rougher. So that, um, then in addition to, uh, the uh, inscription panel and the pillars. The only other two features, uh, hardscape features, are an information panel. And you see those all over town uh, telling the history at uh, different parts of town. The Capitol has asked that this information panel be the front page of the paper the day after the shooting. And that's what you see on the right. And that would go uh, towards the entrance as you uh, well, if, if we want to go back to the uh, plan, Lisa, if that's possible. All right. Um, you come in this, uh, the path off of uh, compromise, you pass uh, a bench and the two benches, one on the uh, sidewalk and one on the granite path are uh, the city standard uh, Victor Stanley uh, backless benches. And then you see a person reading the information panel at the, at the very beginning of the wall. And then, and then you walk in and you see the inscription of the uh, First Amendment. And then the end of the wall on the right has, has a recognition panel. Uh, this uh, uh, memorial took on an interesting, um, it got legs. So the city said, yes, you can have the land. The county executive said, we want to pay for it. And then the governor said, we want to pay for it. <laughs> So we have to have a recognition plaque that talks about the governor, uh, the state government, the county government, the city government, and the committee, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Committee. So that plaque, it shows a very modest size there, but that was drawn before um, we realized how many people we have to get onto that plaque. And I, I think, uh, at least I showed at the end, uh, a picture of a plaque uh, in front of the Peka house uh, there, yeah. So uh, I guess the lettering would be about that size. They're just a lot of names. And uh, another example of a recognition plaque would be the Foot Soldiers Memorial across from the county office buildings. There you see um, the names of the people that were behind the creation of that, including uh, the county uh, Council and this, I think the city council and, and the committee. 
So I think uh, the oh, oh the only other thing is that we we we're going to have it, uh, a stabilized uh, gravel under the trees in in front of the uh, wall, so that people can wander uh, around. And uh, this is um, exceptionally pervious, even though sometimes the uh, different governments don't give you credit for that, but. Uh, it, it is, um, you know, the water moves very quickly through it. And when it comes up to the trees, instead of being stabilized, it's more like a mulch. Uh, and then I think the next picture is, uh, we're gonna do lots of um, native ground covers. So our, we're not the rain garden, but we, we, can, we will go up and meet the rain garden so that the rain garden will be native plants uh, in the midst of more native plants. So, um, and this is just an idea. We haven't done the final planting plan yet, but it would be a, a tapestry of uh, native ground covers. And then the timeline is very tight. Um, they, would, they would like to have a ceremony dedicating this memorial a year from this weekend. Uh, on the third anniversary of uh, the shooting when the five people were killed. <laughs> we've been in, we're working closely with a contractor and we've worked with, and we've been talking to the granite people and all the major uh, components of this. And uh, we have a, a good assurance that it can be done. Uh, we have to come in after the archeology span and we have to hope that we don't have um, a disastrous weather spring, but we've we've got uh, we're we're aiming for completing a month before the dedication date so that I can sleep at night. Questions? Hey Jay, hey Jay real quick, can I, um, it, just a general question regarding your timeline. Does it seem like this project is remote enough from the stormwater and all the other things that it can be executed separately? And, and do you feel, and does Lisa agree? <laughs> well, we've been working closely with AECOM and, and uh, Lisa in the city. Um, there, there will be construction, uh, uh, certainly on the side where the, the deep well is. Um, there's far, it's far enough back to, the, uh, to Ed's work that I don't think that's an issue. Uh, when the, I might mention when the splash pads disappeared, <laughs> we were able to move this whole memorial five feet back away from compromise oh, and to add more trees behind it. So there's, yeah. it's in a bigger green space than, than was before. And some of that green space uh, will be construction. So the final nice uh, landscape around the edges probably won't be finished, but right. the front of the memorial and you'll be able to walk into it and, and all that. I don't think that's a problem. But you're removed from the infrastructure and the, um, any of the more heavy construction so you can proceed? Well, I think um, everybody else could comment more than I could on uh, whether that's, but I'm sure there'll be a construction wall uh, as a backdrop to the memorial. Oh, of course. <laughs> so related to that, this is Roberta. Um, Lisa, can you uh, get through the entire application process in order to make this deadline for the memorial? Well, we're, we're definitely uh, working together to achieve that as according to our uh, schedule, we, we're getting our 100% drawings in, uh, in a few weeks, uh, beginning of July. And uh, we, as I said, we've already uh, submitted or some of our permits. Uh, we'll work through the summer to obtain the others with the goal of coming to HPC in a formal application uh, in September. So we hope to have, we, uh, as Scott was talking, we've been working very closely with MHT and FEMA. So we um, feel confident that we should, um, if not, have them by September have at least enough documentation that you hopefully would be able to give us a conditional approval. We're working very hard. We, we, we want to uh, meet all the deadlines that we've laid out. And then in terms of the construction, 
um, we've committed to the um, memorial um, uh, designers and uh, uh, the Martin Luther King uh, committee that's uh, sponsoring this, that uh, since we'll just be getting We'll just be awarding our contract at the beginning in January of 2021. And so uh, we've already committed that if we don't have a contractor on board yet for our flood mitigation project, we would hire a local contractor just to clear the area for the memorial so that they could proceed with their work. That's, that sounds great. Um, and okay. Like and we're got, just real quick, we're, right now, this is one application, uh, multiple components, but one application for right now. Yes. Okay. And we'll keep it as one application because the, um, the memorial is part of the parcel and the parcel needs to be reviewed in its totality in terms of its impacts to the view sheds and all the, the criteria that you have. So we're... Um, they're they're with us through our permitting process. Okay, Roberta, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Yeah, that's quite all right. And uh, two questions for Jay. One is, uh, is as um, Tim asked previously, is there any lighting related to this? Um, we haven't finished the design, but there are two street lights that will um, illuminate the wall. Uh, you can see them at the bottom of this plan. See those two, two street lights? Uh, in addition to that, we are exploring having a, a light, uh, a, a way of washing a light across the inscription, but not an up light. Mm -hmm. And we're, we have to work on that. Uh, and we propose to show it to you in September. Okay. And also, um, the commission uh, will want to see the exact wording on any of the plaques. And uh, we, we might have the Heritage Commission take a look at it. And it, you know, it, it, is, it is not to make corrections or changes on the people that were involved. But uh, for example, the um, plaque that is with the statue now uh, at West and Taylor has spelled Michael Michelangelo's name wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so we would like, and there have been several other disasters uh, related to plaques um, because the Heritage Commission hasn't had a chance to look at them. And um, I, I often use them just as I would use an architect or an archeological consultant. Um, but anyway, I'm sure uh, the commission would like to um, see the wording of any plaques in addition to um, the rest of the application. So what, I, what I would say, we would always put a condition that the Heritage Commission would look at the wording. <laughs> so we, we put the condition, we'd put that on the Heritage Commission, I would say. And if you don't know, and Jay, if you don't know about the plaques, I mean, that can always be a revision later, um, later. you know, after the application approval. But I think we pretty much do know the plaques. We, we, okay. we would have it ready very soon if, uh, I guess, Lisa, you can give me the information for the Heritage Commission. Yeah, we're very close. So. Okay. And uh, okay. by the way, John Tower, if you're still around, um, feel free to weigh in at any time when they ask for questions. Okay. I'll tell you what, um, Lisa, is that the end of your presentation? No, the last thing is the bulkhead. <laughs> that I'll, I, I only have two seconds. We'll when, we're done, we'll, we'll, when we're done, we'll come back and we'll ask for um, input from anyone who wants to on each of the components. Uh, okay. We'll go through them one at a time. Okay. So this is the um, plan uh, sheet uh, showing, illustrating the bulkhead. Um, you can see uh, Newman Street with the fleet reserve on the right and the um, 110 compromised parking lot on the left. There are boardwalks sloping down to Newman Street. And so the bulkhead will be approximately 50 feet long 
total in total and the three discharge pipes they'll be coming from the wet well uh, if you recall in the um the plan view of the uh plaza area those th three large hatches that um uh remain let me see if i can go back to them. remain had talked about um right here these three large hatches are there's the pumps are underneath each of those so those are maintenance hatches to access um, three 100 horsepower pumps. And then the pipes from those pumps come out to Newman Street and turn down towards uh, Market Slip and they will pass through the bulkhead. So those are the three discharge pipes. Um, off to the right, I don't think I can see it on here, but that's just a side view. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Next. Here's an elevation section. So this is, if you were in Market Slip looking back towards Newman Street, um, the the uh, the new bulkhead will be uh, steel sheet piles, just like the city's bulkhead replacement, two bulkhead replacement projects, and then it'll be capped with concrete. Um, however, right at the end of Newman Street, the concrete cap will extend down quite a bit, um, uh, and the you can see then the discharge pipes will pass through them. The discharge pipes will have backflow preventers in them. So, uh, water will not be able to back up through them. And um, you can see on the side, there's um, mooring piles. We'll still have that um, fenders and the uh, gap between behind the new bulkhead and the existing wood bulkhead will be backfilled with, um, with uh, crushed stone so we will we will all, present all, all consistent with what's already kind of the the yes, yes, design is, of the cap all consistent yeah. okay this design is exactly the same as what was done in our other two bulkhead projects and we will be going before port wardens with this as well okay and we've applied uh mde and army corps have also uh reviewed these plans and so then the last thing is just to talk about our milestones. Again, uh, we expect the uh, submittal of 100% design plans for phase one. Recall phase one was that the red outlined area that consists of the bulkhead, the uh, wet well, the control building, the generator enclosure, um, those items. And then uh, from there, these are the list of all the permits and their current status. As I said, we've already submitted uh, for the joint permit. It's been updated twice, most recently this past May. Um, once the 100% design plans come in, we would submit them to the, go through the city's permitting process for a building and a marine permit. Um, grading and erosion and sediment control uh, go to the soil conservation district at the county level. We have port wardens. We've already received approval for the project from the Critical Area Commission. We're con um, consistent with our own regulations. Um, we anticipate coming back to HPC in September for a formal application. Um, we're working as in closely with the Maryland Historic Trust through the archaeological process. And uh, we anticipate by September that we'd be working with them and FEMA uh, developing a programmatic agreement uh, for the um, this archaeological data recovery. Um, once we have all of our uh, permits uh, in hand, we'll be putting it out to bid. Um, I expect a slightly extended uh, bid process, uh, assuming we get the FEMA grant uh, funding. Uh, you know, we'll be following federal regulations uh, for that. So sometimes it's a little bit lengthier process. Um, then we would uh, start initially the archeological investigation, the data recovery that Scott had talked about. And also um, if we don't have the contractor for this particular project on board um, in time to clear the site for the memorial, we would hire a local contractor and get that taken care of. And then um, you know, there's a lot of long lead items for our project. So uh, as soon as the contractor's on board, we would uh, start with that. And then um, the sequence of construction, we're not clear on. Usually uh, we have a, a, you know, a proposed one. We have a lot of uh, things to work around, boat show and um, just different uh, activities that go on. So we would work closely with the contractor. Well, 
<laughs> flooding, yes, <laughs> work closely with the contractor to come up with um, a sequence of construction that's most efficient. And then um, we talked about that second phase, which um, is currently unfunded, which would realign the other uh, adjacent storm drain system to the wet well. Um, that uh, once the 100% is submitted, AECOM will then uh, complete the phase two um, design drawings. They're, they're currently at 95%. We received 95% drawings for the entire project in the fall. Um, they, they've proceeded at a fast pace to wrap up just the phase one so we can get started with that. And then once, uh, you know, as we go through the permitting process, they'll complete the phase two uh, construction drawings. Quick question there is the phase two that you're talking about, which is primarily um, re rerouting under, underground yes. uh, drainage. It, it, do you think there's going to be any HPC impact on that or is it, or is it all underground? It's all underground. It'll be all work. It will be utility trench work in within the street, within compromise along the curb. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. And actually just answered one of my questions was what was going to be the impact on the actual street of both phase one and phase two, and what was it gonna what was it gonna impact? And I think you just answered that question. So, and there'll, there'll be an extensive maintenance of traffic plan for the phase one. You know, the um, uh, part of the construction, the um, contractor will be required to keep access to the fleet reserve open. And um, we've been talking with both of the adjacent property owners along Newman Street um, about the project and the impacts to their site. So um, we recognize they have to have access for their trash and things like that. But when you finish, everything in the street will essentially be the same as it was before. So. Yeah. Okay. Be, yes, no patching. It'll be okay. curb to curb. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Is that it, Lisa? That's it. Wow, that's great. All right. Um, so I, I think um, what I'd like to do is get input from staff and uh, commissioners on each of the sections, if that's okay. And, uh, I actually have I actually have some more questions. I know. I was going to say, we're just going to, are they, go ahead, Pat, which, which, well, would do you we want to ask, am I to ask questions now or when we get to the input part? No, this is question, this is a, a pre app, so it's, it's free flow. It's not, we're not in deliberation. So, in any so Lisa, I've got some questions from the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from your initial, um, from the first part of the presentation regarding, I mean, you've got a pretty tight, and um, how much of that funding is is actually in place and guaranteed? Because the FEMA funding, which is not uh, in place yet, is it? No. So the FEMA funding is the only piece we don't is the largest chunk of the funding outstanding. But we have been working. Uh, closely regular conversations with MEMA, FEMA, and MHT. Um, you know, we've asked them, we, we've had to revise our scope. Um, we, as a matter of fact, we just recently our scope to address the construction phasing. But, um, you know, it's been three years since we've applied. We've been assured along the way. We, we continue to ask, you know, at what point, you know, have we submitted, have we met all your requirements? So we're there, the, the funding is committed, it's just not been awarded. Okay, but, you, but you've got the funding from the state from all the, the other, uh, Yes, MDE. yes, a $2 million state grant, the 1 million from MDE, um, the 150, uh, 1.5 million from the city has been appropriated last year. <laughs> And um, we just, this fiscal year, just uh, the governor's budget had an additional $750,000 in it. Okay. And then um, by not doing phase two, how will that impact the success or failure of phase one? So the, the storm drains that are, would be realigned as part of phase two, they currently don't back up onto the street. Th those are um, drains that, um, there's really only two, I think two outfall pipes, one that's, uh, goes under the Donner lot 
and mm -hmm. um, we've not we see occasionally some flooding in the Donner lot that would be and occasionally you get flooding right along Memorial Circle but that's more it when you have the extreme tides and it comes up out of the dinghy dock that submerged mm -hmm. um, park area so mm -hmm you wouldn't, it's not the significant flooding that you see at Newman Street where the road is actually closed. Okay. And I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask this question correctly, but um, you, earlier in the presentation, you spoke about building to a, a level 3.2, although it should be at a five, but because of fleet reserve being at 3.2, um, yeah. you could only build to 3.2. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Well, I mean, we could build yeah. to five, but we'd be, a, you know, over a foot and a half higher. But the reality is the surface elevation of the water in market slip, if it's up at four, it's going to yeah. come over the back deck and still flood Newman Street. So to put out the expense now to build a bulkhead to five didn't seem to make sense. And there's nothing that can be done with fleet reserve. I know it's private, I, but working with them to build that up to a five so we are we've been in conversations with them they're actually uh -huh. looking to replace their board uh, their um bulkhead as well and we're trying uh -huh. to uh, determine a way if that could even be done uh, in conjunction with our project so they're very interested in um in extending that bulkhead beyond the entirety of their uh water frontage okay Okay. Hmm. Um, I think that's, those are my questions. Anyway, I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Great. We're going to have to do kind of the master overall plan. Um, does anyone have any questions about archaeology, the archaeology component of this? Like we did already discuss the I think the fact that what we do with these artifacts once we have them is another project. Um, but did anyone have any questions or comments on the actually very exciting new project? <laughs> and Roberta, if you want to make any comments. I don't think I'm going to be able to say anything because there's a terrible echo and um, it, something keeps saying you're muted, you're unmuted, you're muted, you're unmuted. Uh -oh. Yeah, I'm hearing that too. And I'm wondering what, what's, what's happening that there's such an echo. Yeah, it's usually some, yeah, it's, you never know who, it's unfortunate, it's not, not anyone in particular, but it feeds back from your phone into your computer and you get that sound. Roberta, you wanted to say unmute. That that tells that it, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Well, John yeah, Tower, I, for instance, can you mute yourself, John Tower? I can mute. <laughs> yeah, everyone. Everyone should be unmuted except for the two or three are muted except for the people that are talking. Here's what's happening sometimes. I just see, John, you're not muted. Not muted. Unless you want to talk. There it is. The whistle. Yeah. It went away now? No. No. My voice is, coming. My voice is going into somebody else's computer. So. All right. So, Roberta, you want. Um, so I'll just let, we'll try again with Roberta. Do you have any additional comments, Roberta? On any particular section? Yeah, go ahead. You've got the floor. Um, no, I, I, can, I consider the project feasible as presented, but I'll discuss some finished details uh, for example, the railing and the metal roof, we may need to get into those further uh, during the application process. Okay. I'll just go around. Bobby Collins, do you have any comments on any component that you'd like to make? 
Uh, no, I just, um, the one thing I wasn't clear on when we were talking lighting is the only lighting I heard about were the two down lights over the entrances to the two buildings, the enclosure, and then the generator, and then the two street lights. And if there are any other lights, um, obviously we need to make sure that those are included in the, the lighting plan that we see with the, the full application. Okay, Bill Williams, any thoughts on any component? Um, nothing, nothing specific right now, no. Okay. Pat, anything else in, in detail? Um, just uh, a general, you, you know, you're showing a lot of nice plantings in the area. So just uh, some type of maintenance plan and how, how the site will be maintained, the plantings will be maintained. Will there be any type of watering system? Is that a necessary component? Um, detail on the, um, any lighting or, or um, metal finishes, railings, whatever. And one other thing, what was it? Um, I can't think of it, so it must not have been terribly important. So that's all I can think of. And if I think of something else, I'll raise my hand and okay. add it. Kim, if you're still with us. No, I'm still here. Um, <laughs> I'm very excited about the level of archaeology that's happened. And, okay. and, and I think there's been a lot of thoughtful consideration of a variety of things that have happened. So I think others have raised uh, other concerns that will be addressed as we move forward, and and uh, I I appreciate the process we've been going through. Yeah. Um, we did get one public comment. Um, I switched away. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, we got one public comment from Ellie Tierney, uh, Ward One Alderman. Um, I just it, again, it, we don't typically take public comments on. Uh, pre-applications, but we have in the past kind of said, if you're interested, please participate. Um, and it's a supportive, uh, um, so I'll just read it for you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this long awaited project. It has evolved into a more reserved plaza develop redevelopment. I understand that this is due to funding constraints. Um, I assume you will be reviewing this as a historic streetscape with respective guidelines and that it includes the associated, associated vegetation and hardscape. I support the revised plan, which is less cluttered and eliminates the splash pad. The substitution of bioretention pond is a win-win as it will meet our revised city requirements as we are adding aesthetic landscape. Um, I hope you will guide this project through you, with your comments. So it's a pu public presence in the city that is suitable for such an important memorial. Okay, and where am I? Click, I think I'm back. <laughs> um, so I, I concur with what everyone has said and just from a, from a guidance point of view, I'll kind of wrap up and Tammy, um, this is the part where we kind of, uh, I think, um, the only other thing that no one else has mentioned, I think on the memorial, um, the final drawings for the memorial, the, the actual dimensions, the heights of these uh, items, the pillars and the walls, we had mentioned a concern about the, um, the bulk, uh, or the height of, of the wall. So in the final drawings, it would be very good to have the exact height. Uh, Jay, I think you quoted what they were, but if they were on the drawings, that would help us. Um, and um, I think it's a great idea that you included the fact that around the city, um, there are, they're all over the place. And the Carroll Garden Wall along the Duke of Gloucester Street came to mind, which is also in, in scale. So if you, uh, that, that'd be another one you could add if you wanted to strengthen your argument. Um, so um, the, in, in, in prior, um, so in summary, um, by the way, are there any questions from uh, the applicant at all at this point about what we said? 
Now, I do have a question. The lighting that keep it keeps coming up, and I'm concerned that you're expecting more lighting. There are three, uh, two or two street lights along Compromise Street in front of the plaza area, and three on Newman Street. So um, we weren't anticipating any additional lighting okay. of the parcel. Um, other than the lighting required uh, for the building structure and the um, the lighting to uh, that we discussed related to the memorial. I guess we just I I, I guess I assume that on the memorial there will be some aspect of design that might include lighting. But if well, you're it, saying there isn't it, it was mentioned that there was going they, he was looking into lighting oh, that would watch yeah. over the memorial. Yeah, over the First Amendment plaque, I believe. And, and then the other thing uh, that's come up a lot I, I, is the maintenance of the plantings. And I just want to point out, I, I don't think Jay mentioned it, but um, the plantings related to the memorial will have an irrigation system, but the plantings for the bioretention are designed to just be watered with, through their drought resistant. That, that's the purpose of them. Well, some details about that uh, on the memorial would be good. Okay. Um, and then I guess the other question I have on the memorial, the kind of the the splayed rocks that are all they're all on the same surface, I assume. They, they, the, the, the paving that is kind of in a fan shape is all on the same level. There's not steps there, right? I, I believe that's my understanding. If um, if Jake no, no steps, it's all it's all one plane. Okay. Um, so any other questions from the applicant? I don't have any. Great. Um, well, over the multiple applications we've had, um, or the three applications we've had, we believe these components are all feasible, um, including, um, the, um, the control and generator building, um, the park landscape design and the memorial design. Um, the applicant, the, um, sorry, too many pieces of paper going here. Um, we always like to kind of include the guidelines that we've been talking about and these apply um, in varying uh, components of the application, but um, B3 is, has to do with height and bulk of building and B5 was has, to, has to do with scale and massing of buildings, and that applies to the, uh, the generator and um, control building and the um, memorial. Uh, landscape design and materials is C1. Uh, landscape place, plants is C9. Uh, C11 is paving materials. C12 is street furniture, and that mainly applies to the um, Memorial design and the bioretention plant uh, uh, area and the the, um, the uh, open turf area. Um, D29 has to do with utility meters, which um, I think the only thing we didn't really talk too much about was that one outstanding BG&E um, um, uh, unit that it's probably going to be in the woods. <laughs> it's going to be shielded and you don't have any control. I don't think you have any control over where that is, um, but it should be, uh, it'll be concealed. And then finally, the, the section E of our guidelines deals with archaeology. And I think we've talked a lot about that and you seem to have done a, um, you seem to be very aware of that and have handled that at the highest levels. If something were discovered in the process, it would amp it up to, to another level and um, it, it does, I think we developed an understanding tonight that the most, the area that's going to be most excavated, which is the wet well, has the least potential, um, which is actually a good news. So um, in that regard, we, I think that our, the commissioners would agree that this is a feasible project and we look forward to a full application in September. Do you, do you feel like you got the feedback you needed, Lisa, and team? Yes. It was a very good presentation. Very thorough. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. Thank yeah, you. Just, you, you. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah, what was funny was that when we got what we got uploaded for the commissioners, 
was the very incredible 100% design drawings. I said, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> but your presentation, you nailed it. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I wasn't expecting to have to submit something ahead of time. And that seemed to be a new requirement. In the past, you didn't require something. So we kind of pulled some things together and yeah. with remotely our CAD tech just kind of cobbled it, scanned yeah. it, sent it off <laughs> in no order. <laughs> well, when, when, well, that's fine. We did institute this about a year ago for pre-application. It gives us a chance to ask better informed questions. If we can do a little bit of homework ahead of time. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it was about a year ago we started doing it. Okay. Okay, anyone, um, any other questions, comments on this? All right. Um, I, we have no, uh, no other administrative business uh, this evening. Um, any uh, other, anyone have any other business that they'd like to discuss? No. Hearing, seeing no motion in the chamber, um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? A second. All right, thank you very much. Thank I'll you. I'll make one final check with Tammy. Tammy, did I forget anything? Nope, I think you got everything.